Hello everybody, Chris here, and in this video I want to give you guys my top 5 tips for beginners getting started with DaVinci Resolve 16. So first up, autosave features. So if you go up to DaVinci Resolve's main menu and you go down to preferences, you can find the autosave features on the user tab. So you may need to click over here for user, not system, and you can go to project save and load. And by default, I believe that these are turned off, live save and project backups. So the first setting here, live save, what it's going to do is that when you make changes to your DaVinci Resolve project, it's automatically going to be saving those to the project file. So basically, whatever you do is going to be automatically saved. And that means that you don't really need to go and hit Control S to save the project every couple minutes. And it also means that if Resolve happens to crash, that your last change should be saved automatically. So for instance, if I just go in here and I delete this item from the timeline, and then we go out to the project manager, we shift to another project. And now let's shift back to the beginner tips project. That that change we made where we deleted the item from the timeline was saved automatically. I didn't have to press Control S or anything. And that can be really handy, especially if you're the kind of person who forgets to save frequently. One case where you might want to turn off live save though is if you don't actually want to save the changes to your project because your changes are being saved automatically. So if you wanted to make some changes for a tutorial video or something, then you may want to actually turn live save off. Okay, the other option is project backups. So in addition to having all of your changes saved to your project file automatically, you can actually have a backup of your project be stored. And by default, it's set to every 10 minutes. I've gone ahead and changed it to every 15 minutes because I think that's generally plenty. And you can see here that there's settings for hourly backups for the past two hours by default, and then daily backups for the past two days. This is going to mean basically that with hourly backups for two hours, that it's going to have two hourly backup files. And then the daily backups, once again, are going to have two files because one per day. So if you go into your file explorer and you go to the location where your project backups are stored, then you would be able to see the project file backups which you can use in a project to go back to an earlier state if you wanted to undo changes or if for some reason the project files got corrupted. So if you want to revert a project back to its project backup state, then you can go to file and project manager. You find the project that you want to resume to an earlier state. You right click it and then you go to project backups and you can find those files listed here, including the date and time when they were modified so that you have an idea of how far back each of those projects, including the date and time of the last modification of that backup so that you have an idea of how far back each of those backups are gonna be reverting your project. So obviously the daily ones are usually going to be further back than the hourly ones, but you can get a good idea of the order just by sorting by date modified. And of course you'd want that to be descending so that the most recent ones show up at the top. So when you're ready and you're sure you wanna revert, you can select one and hit load and it'll load the project back to that state. Okay, so the second tip I've got for you guys is the auto color function of DaVinci Resolve. So let's go drop a clip onto the timeline again. So in DaVinci Resolve, you can go to the color tab if you want to do color grading for your clip to change the look and feel of how your final product is going to be. And there's a lot you can learn about nodes, all of these color wheels and other functions over there, power windows so on and so forth to customize the look and feel of your clips. But if you want to quickly change the feel of your clip and let DaVinci Resolve figure that out for you, then over on the color tab, you have the option of using auto color. So you can select your clip and go up to the color menu and hit auto color. Also, you can see that there's the shortcuts, Alt Shift C by default. And when you apply that to a video clip, DaVinci Resolve is just gonna take a look at the clip and it's gonna to try to apply new color grading schemes across it to enhance the look and feel of the clip. So basically it's automatic color grading. So if we just go back to the start of the clip and hit play, you can see that the colors are very vivid now and basically this was done just with one button press. However, there are cases where auto color does not work very well particularly when the lighting in the video clip is not very consistent. So for instance, if at the start of the clip, um, one example might be like a sunrise before the sun goes up, you have it here at the beginning and it was very, very dark there, but then as the clip progresses, it becomes a lot brighter because the sun comes out. 
then auto color wouldn't work really well there because it tries to find good color grading to apply to the entire shot. And what may look good on one frame won't look good on another because there's a big difference in lighting. Uh, but for shots like this, where basically it's the same lighting, the same look and feel across the entire shot, then auto color can do a pretty good job because it's not too complicated and everything kind of looks the same in the shot. So I think that's when auto color is going to do best. So let's just do a really quick before and after. I'll click this icon up here to get rid of the color grading temporarily. So this returns it to the original shot, uh, a lot more dull and somber. And we can play it there. And while we're playing, let's just re-enable the color grading that was done automatically. And you can see the difference there. Now, of course, because it's automatically decided, you know, Resolve isn't going to know what you're going for. So maybe you did want it to be very dark and somber from the beginning. And then you turn on the automatic color grading and it's just really vivid and it doesn't match the feel of your video. Then in that case, auto color might not really work well and you would need to do some manual color grading. So a quick place to look for that if all you want to do is mess with the colors in your video clip is that you could go to the color tab and use a lookup table for that. So under LUTs, you have film looks here. So first I'm going to right click on this node and reset the node grade. You can see that auto color here is indicated by that icon. So we can reset it back to the default by hitting reset there. And then you can use the film looks tab and LUTs lookup tables and uh, find a film look that looks good for your video and your clips, whatever you want to go for. And let's close that clips tab so that this window is a little bit bigger. So looking through these and then double clicking on one to apply it to your video is one way you can get more control over how your video is going to look uh, without going into manual color grading. Okay, so tip number three, verify your timeline frame rate before you start editing. So if we go up to file and project settings, then you'll see here in master settings that the timeline frame rate is locked out. The reason for this is that once you create your timeline and add any clips to it, you can no longer go in here and change your frame rate. So if you want your project to be working with a specific frame rate, then you should change that before you add your first clip or when you add your first clip, it'll give you the option of changing the project to that clips frame rate settings. So whatever you want your project frame rate to be, you got to set that before you really get started with things because you can't change it later. So uh, what you can do if you've already added some stuff to your timeline is to just remove it and then actually delete your timeline. And now if we go up to file and project settings, we'll be able to change that again. So let's take the timeline frame rate and set that to 30, the playback frame rate and set that to 30. Video format, might as well do that also for consistency. All of these settings matching up. So we'll go ahead and hit save. And yes, we want to change the project frame rate. So I'll hit change and I'll drag this video clip into the timeline. Now, the reason why the project frame rate was set to something different is that if we select this video and we go to the metadata, you can see that the frame rate for this video clip is 23.976 FPS. So you do have to kind of be careful about that. Although you can mix and match your frame rates and your project, it's obviously better if it can be consistent. One of the problems you'll run into while you're editing is that if you use different frame rate video clips on a timeline that's playing back in 30 frames per second, sometimes it will slow down the playback performance in DaVinci Resolve. And I think sometimes I've also run into audio desyncing issues, but ultimately you can usually still export your project to a new video file with a new frame rate and it'll be okay. But obviously if you're doing anything professional, and you want it to look consistent, then you're probably going to want to shoot everything at the same frame rate. So just be aware of that while you are recording your videos and editing them. Okay, so next, tip number four. And this one I think especially applies to beginners that don't really want to mess around in the inspector directly too much. Maybe it looks a little overwhelming at first, but when you want to change properties like the position or the sizing of your video clips, uh, you can certainly do that over here, manually adjusting the numbers. But another option is to enable the viewer overlay. So the viewer overlay is found in the bottom left hand corner of the video preview in the edit page. So that is right down here. It's actually a drop down menu. So there's different viewer overlays you can use while you're editing your video. So the first one is the transform. So if you want to scale, rotate, or just the position of your video clip on the screen, uh, this gives you all of the tools in order to do so. So you can basically click on any of the circle corners or the circles halfway if you want to stretch the screen. So because this video clip doesn't actually match the width and height of the project, we could still use the video clip and get rid of this black space by stretching it a bit. So if we left click on the middle bottom and I stretch this out, 
you can see that this is stretching it vertically up and down. You'll notice on the right side for the inspector, it says over there uh, a, a different value than 1.0. So when I scale the value to increase its vertical size, we get a value for the Y more like 1.033 or 1.1. So if I hit control Z, I undo that. And if I wanna scale the X and Y at the same time, which is probably what you're usually gonna to wanna to do so that everything's still in proportion, then you can click on one of the corners and you can scale it. And then you'll see that the X and Y are linked together. Alternatively, you can click on any side and hold shift down and that will force it to lock in place as well. So it's gonna be scaling at the same rate. But as soon as you let go, it's going to start scaling the X and Y individually. So it's probably better to just use the corners if you do want to make sure that that lock stays in place. But generally with these tools, using Control, Alt, and Shift is going to slightly adjust the tool that you're clicking on. So this handle sticking out here controls the rotation of your video clip. So if you left click on it, you can rotate the entire clip around the timeline frame. And you can see that it works in 360 degrees rotation. So 360 is is rotating it once fully. And of course that works in negative directions as well. You can also left click anywhere on the clip inside the white bounds and drag it around. So this will pan your video clip, basically adjusting the X and Y position to wherever you need it to be. So in addition to the transform viewer overlay, you also have options like crop. So if you want to cut away any of the edges on the screen, you can do so. So you left click on one side and you pull this in. And that's going to basically just remove that part of the video from whatever shows in the final clip. There's also some other options when you want to get a little bit more in depth with Resolve, but those are the two main ones for right now for simple edits. So it just makes things a little bit more visual rather than having to think in terms of numbers. You can just look at the screen and see how it's actually going to affect everything as you make those edits. Okay, and the final tip for this video is that in DaVinci Resolve, almost every single property that you run into is keyframable and what i mean by that is that when there is a number you want to change such as the clips transform values like the zoom and the position of the clip that you can animate those over time by putting keyframes on your clips so a keyframe is basically a moment in time a single frame where it has a set value so you might have the position set to 100x for instance let's actually just go ahead and do that so at uh, about one second in here on the timeline i'm going to keyframe the position to have a x value of 100 which pushes the clip over to the right instead of being directly centered so if i keyframe it by clicking on this little gray diamond and this is how you create your first keyframe for every property that is keyframable then now it has a keyframe which means that at one second, it is going to have an X position of 100. Now, if you have not changed the X position at any other frames and set new keyframes, then that is basically just going to be the value for that property for the entire clip. Because although it's keyframed at one second to be 100, nowhere else has a keyframe, which means that that keyframe determines the value for the entire duration of the clip. But as soon as you wanna add in a second value at a different point, like let's say four seconds here, then you can change the value at that point in time thus creating a new keyframe. And so once there is one keyframe at one point in the timeline for that clip, you don't need to click on the diamond and turn it red anymore. You can just change the value of the property at that new timeline frame that you want it to be set at. So if I set the position X to 800 now and I hit enter, then you can see that the keyframe diamond over here turns red, which means that a new keyframe is set. If you wanna see all of your keyframes, you can click on this part of your clip which will show you all of the keyframes for your properties that you have set keyframes on. So you can see that there is one over here at one second and it is snappable. So as long as you have snapping enabled, your timeline cursor will just snap to that frame. And then when you're there, you can see the value at that keyframe. So 800 at four seconds. And then over here, it is 100 at one second. And of course, this timing is relative to the clip, not the timeline. So if you move your clip in your timeline, then uh, the keyframes are gonna move with the clip, not the timeline. So what having these keyframes allows DaVinci Resolve to do is to animate between those clips by modifying the value as time goes on. So if I go back here to the start of the clip and I hit play, then as soon as one second is hit, it's going to animate between one second and four seconds. So the value increases over this time here, just like that. And so that is how you can do 
a lot of animation within DaVinci Resolve. So obviously this example of moving the X position on the screen when you only have one video clip and thus leaving a lot of black space, not the best, but it does kind of demonstrate how you could do things. Maybe you want to move a logo on the screen, a PNG image that sits on top of other things. Maybe you're adjusting the text for a title and you want to decrease its zoom to make it look smaller and then increase it as it goes on in order to create a zoom in effect. There's a lot of possibilities when you start using keyframing. So it's really important. And yeah, it's just good to know that in DaVinci Resolve, you can animate most properties and that's part of what makes it really powerful software. So one more related mini tip here. If you start keyframing your properties, there will be times where you accidentally set a value at a different frame than you meant to, thus creating an extra keyframe. So for instance, if I went like really close to four seconds here and I increased the value here just like a little bit in the inspector, then you can see a new keyframe is created here. So whenever something is going a little bit wonky with your keyframes, you can just expand the drop down menu for your clip and make sure that all of the keyframes are in the position they're supposed to be and that no extra ones were created. If you do see an extra one, you can just snap the timeline cursor to that keyframe and then uncheck the red diamond, which removes the keyframe. And now there's only going to be two values here that determine the animation. The first keyframe we intended and the last one, but no extra stuff in between. Okay, so that aside, that is basically my top five tips for beginners in DaVinci Resolve. I hope you found all of these to be really useful, especially if you're just getting started in DaVinci Resolve. So I've been Chris. Thanks for watching, and I will see you guys in my future video content.